There were lots of new technological inventions that really characterized World War I. The trenches were just one. That's not really a technological advance. You dig a hole in the ground and you make it really long. It did work because, because of the technology they were using. But perhaps the most important piece of technology, the thing that made World War I go on for so long, despite everything that both sides tried to do, was the machine gun. Because the machine gun gave one soldier the killing power of hundreds. They didn't have to reload very often. They could shoot very, very fast. And so when one side would come out of their trench and go over the top and attack the other side, the other side would be sitting there with machine guns, sometimes killing so many people that they had to stop because of just the inhumanity of it all. And while that was really important, there are other pieces of technology that made the war even worse. Poison gas was developed in order to, to try and drive people out of the trenches and cause some real problems. Sanitation was horrible in, in, in the trenches. People got that dreaded thing called trench foot, which trust me, you don't want to know too much about. Airplanes really became a part of warfare during World War I, mostly for reconnaissance, but increasingly, in other words, reconnaissance means that they, they would go and, and keep an eye on what was going on in other trenches, but more and more planes started fighting one another. Tanks showed up uh, in World War I as a way of going over the trench, just driving straight over it, but they were real late in the war and they didn't really figure out how to use them well enough to make it make a whole lot of difference. Uh, during the actual war itself. Um, you also have the U-boat. And the Germans developed the U-boat, which is essentially a submarine, in order to make things a whole lot more even between them and the British. The British Navy was so much larger than the Germans that they had to have some way of evening the playing field. And so their solution was go under the water. Now ultimately, and this is something that you're going to hear about later, Ultimately, those submarines are exactly what caused their downfall. Because the submarines are going to get the United States in the war. And ultimately, when we come into the war, there's nothing the Germans can do to stop us. So, kind of backfired on them, if you know what I'm saying. Oftentimes, World War I is characterized as a total war. And it was. It was horrific. The total war had really a couple different things, but the first one's what I want to talk about now, because it wasn't just fought in Europe. We always think about troops in France fighting one another, Germans on one side, French and English on the other side, eventually the Americans coming in, but it, that wasn't it. There was an Eastern Front as well, where the Germans were also fighting the Russians. There was a, there, there was a front where the Turks were involved fighting against the British. And, and maybe in the most poignant part of all of this, or at least something that, that merits our attention, is the Gallipoli campaign, which was an attempt by Britain to come back and to sort of backdoor their way into the Ottoman Empire. It was completely unsuccessful. So many people died trying to take one small little area of land the area of land which would ultimately allow their ships to go on up to the Black Sea. But they couldn't do it. And it created not only a sense of failure in the British, it created a huge number of casualties for British colonial troops, mostly Australian and New Zealanders. In fact, these days for Australian and New Zealand uh, young people, this is almost a rite of passage, a pilgrimage to go and see the site where their ancestors and their countrymen died for a cause which ultimately had very little to do with them, Australia or New Zealand. And it also gave rise to one man who would characterize Turkey, what the Ottoman Empire would become after the war, for a long time. And his name is Ataturk. Ataturk became known for his courageous fighting against the Anzac, the Australian and New Zealand troops. Um, and would ultimately go on to lead the Ottoman Empire, which will be called Turkey, into a new secular form of government, where religion was there, but it didn't define the new Turkey, where the new Turkey was maybe more European than the old Ottoman Empire had been.
total war really means making war on the entire society. It's not just about fighting uh, other troops, it's about fighting the entire country. And in World War I, we really saw this happen. First of all, there's lots of conscription. People are being drafted into the military. When you lose 10 million soldiers in a war, you're gonna have to find a place for them to come from, and not everybody's gonna volunteer. And so wartime drafts characterized the entire thing. But that wasn't enough, because wartime drafts only work if people think that the cause they're fighting for is good. And so the governments in all the countries involved in the First World War engaged in propaganda efforts. Propaganda efforts that really had a couple of aims. Number one was to make the enemy seem as inhuman and as horrific as possible turning them into almost animal-like people. And we see a lot of animal-type depictions of cruelty on the part of the Germans and cruelty on the part of the British. It, the cruelty everywhere really is what it is. But there's also a whole lot of propaganda involved in getting people to come out. And they really tug at the heartstrings. Propaganda posters are everywhere telling people, young men essentially, that if they don't come and fight the war, there's really not men at all. And, and, and there's also censorship. The truth of this war really couldn't come home. If people knew the truth about the war, it was feared, they would turn their support from it, and it would be very, very hard to keep the war effort going. Now another thing they did in total war was to attack civilian populations. Early in the war, the Germans used Zeppelins, these big, huge airships, to bomb London. And it was sort of a preview of what might come a few years later if there was going to be, let's say, maybe a second one of these things. Um, and, 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 and it wasn't very pretty. Economic production was completely about the war. I mean, with the war going on, every single resource of the countries had to be focused on fighting the war. That means making stuff that people have to, ha have to use in the war. That means conserving food so that people in the front had enough food to fight with. I mean, it was a total mobilization of the population. It also meant that women had to go to work because increasingly more and more of the young men who were out there were fighting on the front lines. And there just weren't enough people to work in all the factories making all the stuff that they needed to fight on the front lines. So they hired women at unprecedented numbers. Now, you'd think that this would mean a major move forward for women. But unfortunately, it was only temporary. When all these guys came back from war, the women went home. They were fired so that they could hire people who'd fought. Both sides, sides also tried to starve out the enemy. They tried to cut off their supplies. The Germans tried to use their U-boats to surround Britain and France and cut off all outside supplies. In fact, that's what brings the United States into the wars, the fact that we're just trying to trade with these people, or at least that's what we were saying, and, 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 and we kind of get caught up in the war itself. But ultimately, it was the British Navy that was the most successful in starving out the enemy. Things were really, really bad in Germany near the end of the war. And one of the things that the British would use to try and get the Germans to surrender and to agree to the terms of the surrender was threatening a continued blockade and not allowing any supplies into Germany. It was absolutely successful, so it can't be discounted. Now, also, you have a complete centralization of power in all of these countries. The argument was made that in order to fight a massive war like this, a world war, that the government had to control everything. And the people at the time were very willing to give this power over to the governments. And so governments increasingly controlled every aspect of, of, of the society, from censoring reports about the, about the war effort, to controlling production of goods that were going to go to the war, to rationing food, all kinds of things were seen. Now, while we're not going to really talk about battles or anything like that, there is one that we need to mention. It goes down in history as the Battle of the Somme. The Battle of the Somme was the most destructive battle of World War I. The British decided in 1916 the sitting in trenches wasn't going to do anything. And so they said, we are going to try and take these German trenches. Now remember, the Germans have the machine gun. 
So the British tried to go over the top, as they called it, pulling their men out of trenches, running them across what was known as no man's land, a complete wasteland which had been destroyed by all of the fighting, and to try and get to the German trench and take it. And they figured if they sent enough people over, over a long enough period of time, that the Germans would be overwhelmed. They started with a massive bombardment by their huge guns, which went on for days, day and night, constant bombardment, and assured their troops that all the Germans were going to be dead. Well, guess what? It didn't happen that way. The Germans simply burrowed into the ground. They would already built in areas that had, that had houses and, and, and shelters and things like that. Um, out, uh, next to the trenches, and they simply went in there, were protected by the ground. And when the German or when the British bombing stopped, the Germans came out, and when the British attacked, it was horrific. The British lost over 400,000 troops trying to take the German trenches. Another 200,000 were lost by, by the French. And while they made some minor advances and may have moved a quarter mile here and a quarter mile there, they were pushed back, but they weren't the only ones who lost troops. The Germans lost over 650,000 troops in the Battle of the Somme, putting the death total in soldiers of one battle at over a million people. Think about that. A million people. And ultimately, it was because the leaders on both sides had no alternative. They didn't know how to fight a war with machine guns and tanks and stuff like that. And so they reverted to their old training and tried to overrun the enemy by force. Ultimately it failed. And they wouldn't make that mistake again. 